All right, moving on to um, Dr. Stephen Pierce, uh, who recently presented with us on uh, Angel MD Pitch Club. He is the CEO and founder of EM Tensor. Um, we're excited to hear, Stephen, about your update and um, look forward, because I know there's been a lot that's happened even since you were just on Pitch Club. Okay, yep, we've got a screen. All right, cool. So, and Tenza, uh, we're in the business of accelerating brain injury treatment. Um, and you see a little device there. That's the predecessor to the uh, product device, but it's the one that we can use for prototyping. And, and you know, as you see there, it's actually measuring the, br the brain of uh, one of our staff members. Um, and the important thing about a brain imaging device of this type is if we can make it portable, like this one, it's a bio bioelectromagnetic tomographer, then it can be used pre-ambulance, it can be used in the ER, it can be used to monitor patients in the stroke ICU. Um, and it's a distinctly different modality from MRI and CT. So um, it doesn't use any ionizing radiation. Uh, it uh, is inherently safe. It's a, a thousandth of the power of a cell phone, so it's not a problem. And really the change on this one, Katie, that you, you might have noticed is that little uh, patient adaptation blue uh, region there now is, is, is got a prototypical design. So it's designed to basically allow any size of head in the adult, actually even in kids, uh, to go into this device and, and uh, it, it basically squeezes out the air between the head and the device. And it's a flexible membrane that contains a liquid that's the same relative permittivity as brain tissue. So you notice that uh, there's a little thicker area at the top. Well, that's for if you have larger heads going there, it bulges out a little bit more. That's how that works. But fundamentally, we can detect hemorrhage and ischemia. And I figured I'd give you an update of things that we accomplished in 2021 as the, as the next uh, thing. So clinical trial wise, we published our clinical trial at ESOC 2021 in September. Um, the paper had 100% sensitivity, 97% specificity and detected um, hemorrhages down to 0.13 milliliters. So it's about 500 times better than the competition. And as you might imagine, that created a fair amount of physician excitement. Um, we're up to, I think, more than 30 now, uh, key opinion leaders that are aware of our technology and are actually becoming quite engaged as well. Um, we, we reduced a significant number of major design risks, even actually since the last time we presented, Katie. Um, so you, you, you'll see on the next page that the, most of the plastics and metals are fabricated. Uh, we have new lightware hardware, light, light, lightweight hardware that's been brought up, so it, it uh, works now. Uh, we have this thing called a matching material, which is a key component of the design that actually has a mold. We can build it. We have a recipe, a process, so it's a part that we can make repeatedly. Um, and we've also achieved this thing called phase alignment, which interestingly enough is one of the key enablers that allow us to use it as just a simple device you take the person's head you introduce it to the hole that you saw in the device you hit the button and away you go if we didn't have phase alignment we wouldn't be able to do that uh, and then the last thing is the patient adaptation that i just talked about that little blue area that's uh, made out of a liquid so all of those things are now got actual solutions to them uh, they didn't actually have quite the solutions to them the last time we spoke so quite a lot of it been achieved there we also discovered as part of our concept engineering activity that we, we can validate our usability. So we designed a way from the cart that places the machine at the head of the bed that so many other bedside uh, machines that are very, very heavy uh, are forced into. And we now are able to put it on the bed on a little tray and slide it forward and, and use it in the hospital quite easily. We also identified the top six medical claims from a total of 20 that we think are reimbursable. And we actually went out to physicians and engaged them and got them to give us some feedback. And we were able to prioritize six of them. It's very, very clear that there's a top six. So hemorrhagic exclusion we already studied is one. Ischemic versus uh, hemorrhagic uh, stroke is another. Large vessel occlusion versus small vessel occlusion is another. Uh, TBI is really, a, is there blood in the brain or not? So it's kind of another hemorrhagic exclusion, but a different use case. Um, and one of the things that we learned as we were challenged by people who said, well, hang on a second, it can't possibly be that good, um, is that the reason they were saying that is that if we compare ourselves to CT, which is part of the standard of care for ischemic strokes to basically say there's definitely no hemorrhage in there, so we're not going to hurt anybody, um, then the dual physician read achieves about an 80% sensitivity 
on that 0.13 milliliter uh, hemorrhage that we talked about in our trial, that we managed to achieve 100% sensitivity on. So we are significantly better than the CTs that is in the standard of the care for that very specific purpose today in most parts of the world. So pretty major achievement. And we, we didn't even know that that was the case until we presented the data and the physician told us um, this was the answer. So um, then on the FDA and reimbursement strategy, um, we have a 510K predicate-based draft volume. Um, we're ready for submission. Uh, we're just doing a little bit of uh, phantom studies to support it with performance data. Uh, we also completed a reimbursement report using an external uh, entity, and they told us all about how we could actually easily slip into a hospital under existing CPT codes uh, and existing uh, pots of money that help with the uh, diagnostics. And even then, over time, actually improve upon that. They actually also identified that the primary target is Medicare. Turns out that 60% of ongoing stroke care is falls into the Medicare account. Uh, actually, for 60% of even the initial uh, stroke care falls into the Medicare account. Most of the uh, ongoing uh, cost falls to Medicare as well. So they should be quite kind of proactive in figuring out how to avoid 100, mis 100 million people that are disabled in the world right now that we could potentially remove by stopping them from having strokes over the next 10, 10 years or so. So that's the accomplishments in 2021. Here's a few more. Um, what you have, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but uh, in the top left, you have some of the metal work that uh, is used to build the exoskeleton of the system. Uh, the key component is this four antenna module down in the bottom left. Uh, then you have all the plastic that goes around the, the system uh, to build it up. Uh, in the top right, you have the matching material plug, which is, think of it as almost like a rubber tire because that's kind of what it is, only it's a very special rubber tire with a very specific recipe. There's a black version of that uh, liquid-filled insert that goes inside the rubber tire that's right there as well, just to the, right, to the left of it. And then the bottom right has the circular control board, the uh, processing board, and then a few of the um, individual RFPCB modules ready, ready to be built up. Would you believe we would be at this point in time showing you a picture of a working system were it not for the supply chain problem that we're experiencing with electronic components in the global market. And it fundamentally comes down to, there's about 27,000 parts in a system, down from about 70,000 a year ago. And there's about 35 of them that we literally can't get hold of unless we pay 100 or 1,000 times the usual street price, or we wait the uh, what's called the infinite time period of 27 months in the global supply chain. So. We're hoping to secure enough components to be able to build up four systems. That's why you see parts enough for four systems in that middle picture. Okay, so we're pretty pretty well along, but unfortunately we can't show you a working device right now. Uh, then the highlights for 2022, uh, lots of activity on clinical trials. We have a thousand patient plus trial uh, that we're looking at negotiating with Kazan in Russia that would cover all of those six top um, reimbursable claims. And that's for product development. We have uh, Linz Austria that will continue with the existing trial and probably add another 75 patients. Um, then Kiel Germany is in negotiation, but really that's just a question of just finalize the uh, clinical investigation plan. They've been ready to go for the longest time and they can, they can field hundreds of patients because they're a very large uh, stroke center there. And then recently, even today, we now have, I think three, three US hospitals that are interested in doing a clinical trial with us. Memphis, Tennessee, uh, San Francisco, actually Seta Health, and there's, there's, a, there's an Atlanta um, hospital as well that's interested. And every single one of those is actually operating a mobile stroke unit. So kind of, kind of key that we go into their ER because we can track mobile stroke unit patients as well as uh, ordinary ER patients and the ones that go through their stroke ICU. So. Um, Stephen, I'm going to um, just stop you right there because I think we could spend a lot of time on 2022. This is all super exciting. We yeah. have some great questions from our audience, though. Um, yeah. well, one of which is, once you have 510 clearance, what does your go-to-market look like? And how um, do hospitals or other entities adopt your equipment? What is that going to look so, like? So in parallel with the 510K submission, um, we are uh, also creating the background material to convince clinicians to buy our device. And it would, it would be primarily used by 
stroke ICUs as a monitoring device to prevent people from, you know, there's quite a high uh, mortality rate after treatment in a stroke ICU. Um, so that's the first application. And we would expect small numbers of um, almost research type people to be buying an individual device at that point in time. That'll build a, a, a breadth of uh, literature that would then justify the move to ER. And we're doing ER uh, clinical trials in parallel with even those monitoring trials. That's why we're picking those US hospitals so they sure. can do all three places. <clears throat> and then once we have a justification for why you would want it in the ER, which is to accelerate patients through stroke treatment or to reflect them back home because they don't need stroke treatment, <clears throat> then um, we'll, we'll potentially move it to ambulance applications where it really has the potential in the field. To, to change the world. Because yeah. if you can use it like an EKG, in fact, a physician, an ER doc was talking about using it exactly that way, then they, they were operating two mobile stroke units right now, and they flat out said, there's no way that's going to take over the world because you can never afford to spend $5 million on every ambulance. But every ambulance does have an EKG, does have an AED, and they have those for a reason, because they can save enough people that it's worthwhile for every ambulance to have them. Well, our price point is in that same ballpark for that kind of scenario. So um, that's where we move to. So it, it'll take a while, but we build our clinical proof in parallel with our FDA uh, approval, and then we roll it out to the, to the four applications that we've identified already. Each of those, by the way, is about a five to $10 billion market all by itself. Yeah, very exciting. So, uh, uh, logistical question: yeah. How fast? How long does it take to get the images? How okay. fast is it? And then, um, you know, have you seen or or how? I'm assuming that um, the system can take this into consideration. But there are many patients with. Uh, hemorrhage that may be moving around and may be a little bit agitated. Yeah. Um, so how does it account for those types of things? Okay, so part of the answer to the second question is the answer to the first question. Perfect. It takes, it takes 0.4 of a second to do the data acquisition for a full 3D study. So if they're moving around a lot, it really doesn't affect us. It's not that big of a deal. Um, then, and, and by the way, we compensate for that move around as well. We basically take their brain at whatever angle it was in there, in the machine, and we just symmetrize it and present it to the, the, the physician as if it was, you know, you know, pristine MRI presentation. That kind of thing is something that's done by the tech in the MRI, typically. Um, it takes a little bit of time. So, so it 0.4 of a second to acquire. It's about two minutes to process to get the image back, but you get the full study. You get... You can get a hundred slices if you want, um, and you can get a full 3D DICOM presentation. Um, so, you know, it's it's basically ready to go. The other big advantage that actually we only learned was a huge advantage just recently is um, if you have a thousand slice CT and you have a physician that has to look through that, he flat out tells you he doesn't look at all the slices. No. They do a great job. Well, they can't because I'm can't. guessing. They haven't got, they haven't got the time because it takes, no. they got maybe. Yep. At max, 20 minutes. Now, in our case, we have such a huge contrast for hemorrhage or ischemia that we literally will build a little software agent that says, okay, take them directly to the worst case um, slice because it's the one with the most red. Sure. On, one with the sure. most. Sure. Right. And they go, well, you know, that'll save me 20 minutes right there. In fact, that's that, fantastic. Like, that, even that the even it. the read, I mean, really gets to treatment so much sooner. Exactly. I'm going to have to um, move us on so we can watch our last presenters. But Stephen, thank you for being here. I know there are some additional fantastic questions and Q&A. So mm -hmm. those of you that have those questions, you're going to have to stick around for networking. Um, and every time I hear you present, I have more questions in my head. This is really exciting technology and congratulations on all your successes. Thank you for the opportunity.